Hello and welcome to this week's View in Africa, focusing on the just concluded trial of former president of Chad, Isen Abre. I'm Otilia Anamaonganidze, and I'll be giving this briefing D-Day for Abre, but also what it means for justice on the African continent. Before going into the, the actual trial itself, um, it's quite important to look at how we got here. Uh, on, man uh, on Monday, the 30th of May, uh, Isena Bre was convicted by the Extraordinary African Chambers in Senegal for the crimes he committed and was complicit in committing during his presidency between 1982 and 1990 in Chad. In detailing um, the crimes that Isena Bre himself committed, the judge was stressed very much that Isena Bre created a culture of impunity within, uh, within Chad, but more importantly, that he wasn't only instructing people to carry out these crimes, but that he also carried these crimes out himself. Isena Bre, of course, fled to Senegal in 1990 and has remained in Senegal since then. 26 years on, we have this uh, monumental judgment, which not only says that Isen Abre was what many people had been saying for years, a dictator, but that he was a criminal at that. In 1992, there was a commission of inquiry which looked into the crimes as well as misappropriations of Isen Abre, his accessories, as well as his accomplices. That commission of inquiry in many ways uh, informed the conversations around Isen Abre's crimes and while not using that commission of inquiry's findings as the basis of the judgment, it's quite important to see some of the parallels there. The commission of inquiry, for example, detailed that over 40,000 Chadians were killed at the hands of Isena Bray's government, and many more were tortured and otherwise brutalized by his government. Throughout this period, from before 1990 to date, the victims of the crimes committed by the Isena Bray government have been pushing and agitating for some form of justice. For them, seeing the man who committed the crimes himself, but who also directed people to commit these crimes, being convicted by a court was very, very monumental. When the judgment was handed down, people present in the room, ululating, cheering, lots of tears in people's eyes. Finally, for these people, justice was done. A little bit late, but justice was done moving from the efforts early on in, in Belgium to try to get Isena Bre prosecuted to the eventual support lent by the economic community of West African states, together with the African Union that led to the establishment of this court. The journey, at least for those victims who remain, is hopefully finally over, but there's still a long way to go. There's still efforts that need to be done in terms of re-establishing truth, reconciliation within Chadian society, but more importantly, for this to be a door of history that is finally closed. Now, looking very specifically in terms of um, whether this trial can be regarded as a model, model of justice for Africa, it has been touted as, a, as an example that African courts can meet out justice and that it's important um, that African courts do this themselves. In fact, as for, for as long as we can have domestic prosecutions, then uh, ultimately there's more chance that more people who perpetrate these crimes can be held to account. Now, looking at some of the pros in terms of can this be a model for justice? First and quite importantly, and this cannot be overemphasized, the role of victims not only as the people pushing for justice to be done in Chad, but also as party to the proceedings. The victims in the case against Hussein Abre were there, represented not only as witnesses to his atrocities, but also quite importantly as a recognized party to the proceedings. This is something that can be replicated uh, in a range of other courts across the African continent and also at international level. The second pro, the extraordinary African chambers eventually got the support of the African Union. In many ways, it was through this African Union support, as well as the support of the economic uh, community of West African states, that this trial actually took off. By lending their support to this, to this process, the African Union gave it uh, political legitimacy as well as legal legitimacy. It's important to bear in mind the role that the African Union plays 
on peace, security, as well as justice on the African continent. So to have a court that is fully supported by the African Union in many ways is, 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 is very significant. The third pro is the retroactive justice that came with the extraordinary African uh, court. The crimes that Isena Bre was convicted of were committed between 1982 and 1990. At the moment, for example, the International Criminal Court only has jurisdiction for crimes committed after 1 July 2002. What this means is having courts that can still deal with crimes committed before the ICC was established is very important because not all the international crimes that we're seeing um, being perpetrated even today began after 1 July 2002. But there are some cons and there are some things that need to be considered in terms of, is this really a model of justice in Africa? Firstly, the court was created with an accused in mind. This really was something that was unavoidable. Isena Bre had fled to Senegal and uh, was in exile there. Chad, his home country, had convicted him in absentia. Senegal therefore could not or uh, would not extradite to a country where a person had been uh, convicted in absentia. At the same time, there were efforts to have prosecutions in Belgium, but for Senegal as well as for the African Union, having African justice be meted out outside of the continent was something that they were concerned about. And so uh, this court was created with the prosecution of Isena Bre in mind. The, the problem with that on a, on, a, on, a, on a bigger scale is that the presumption of innocence that is supposed to, to, to apply to all accused is somehow removed because here you've got a court which is created with a person in mind. What would have happened if Isena Bre had been acquitted, for example? While, of course, the, the, the specific case itself showed that Isena Bre was guilty of the crimes, in terms of modeling other justice initiatives against this, this is something that has to be considered. Courts must be created and established for the crimes that they intend to focus on rather than the person. It is this criticism that has been leveled, for example, against other institutions where they claim victor's justice. Of course, the Isena Bre case is a little bit different because it speaks to victim's justice. It speaks to victims pushing as much as they can to be able to, to hold to account a person who perpetrated crimes against themselves. The second con of this model of justice is just how long it took for it to actually begin. Now, starting from 1990, victims were pushing for this prosecution. With the Commission of Inquiry in 1992, there were efforts, at least at domestic level in Chad, to hold people to account. It wasn't until 2000 that there was a groundswell of actual efforts to, to be able to bring Isena Bre to account in Belgium, in Chad, and efforts in Senegal. It took a lot in terms of negotiations between the Senegalese government, the African Union, as well as ECOWAS to finally reach an agreement as to Senegal hosting the court, but then also for them to carry out the prosecution with the support of these institutions. It shouldn't take that long. Victims shouldn't have to live a lifetime before they see some justice. And so in modeling other courts, it's very important to remember that justice delayed often is justice denied. But if anything can be taken away from this, when Isena Bre was convicted, those victims, those survivors who still remain, still celebrated. Because for them, justice is justice. But we mustn't create institutions that are so delayed that they wait 26 years to finally hear from the judge what they had been saying for so long, that Isena Bre created a community, uh, a state in which impunity was allowed. The third point is that international criminal justice is expensive. Uh, for the Isena Bre process, approximately 9 million euros was put towards this prosecution. Now, while 9 million euros in comparison to, for example, the budget for the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the budget for the Special Court for Sierra Leone, uh, and the extraordinary courts in, uh, chambers in the courts of Cambodia, which had a somewhat similar mandate, um, seems quite small 
it doesn't change the fact that 9 million euros is a lot of money. And so there needs to be ways in which we can have domestic justice, regional justice, as well as international justice that is not as expensive. In that regard, African countries must then look to this model of justice coming out of the extraordinary African courts and look to ways in which they can meet out justice at a lesser cost. And in doing that, then justice can be served not only for a person like Hisena Bray, but also for a range of other people as well. In many ways, this is what um, this is what happened when Chad itself prosecuted and convicted 20 people who were complicit in the Isena Bray administration last year. In uh, almost a year to the date, on the 25th of May last year, Chadian courts convicted uh, a number of people who were part of Isena Bray's secret police, uh, the DDS. And so lessons come not only from Senegal and the conviction of Isena Bray, but they also come from his home country, Chad, that has seen it fit to carry on with justice. And so what are the lessons for Africa? And in concluding, first and very important is that victims and survivors of the crimes that were committed by people are really at the heart of justice. Justice is done in, with them in mind. And so having them agitating for justice is very important. But at the same time, this burden should not be placed on victims alone. It is encumbered on investigators, on prosecutors, on the state itself to lend its support to the efforts towards ensuring justice. And with that in mind, the second lesson for Africa is to not delay justice. As and when it's important to respond to the cries of victims and survivors, uh, the criminal justice system must ensure that there is accountability and that accountability is as soon as possible. Victims should not have to wait 26 years to, to, to have the person that they believe was uh, instrumental in the crimes against them to be convicted. The third is to explore options for sustainable peace, security and justice. It's not just about justice, but it's also very important that peace and security speak to the interests of justice as well. And in seeking these uh, options for sustainable peace and justice, one hopes then that these crimes over the long term will not be as widespread, but more importantly, that for African citizens, they can live in a safe, peaceful and secure environment. And in that regard, then, speaking very specifically to justice initiatives, African efforts at domestic and regional level must complement international efforts. In this regard, African states must not absolve themselves of the responsibility of bringing to account perpetrators of international crimes. It is through these efforts to bring to account perpetrators of international crimes that one hopes these crimes can be deterred but also more importantly, that there can be justice served in the interests of peace and justice served for the victims. So the question will arise, what are immunities? As we have seen over the past several years, the issue of immunities has been a grave concern for, African, for the African Union and for some African states, arguing, for example, that a head of state cannot be indicted. Here we have a situation where a former head of state, Isena Bre, was prosecuted, convicted, and now sentenced to life by, by the court in Senegal. But he was a former head of state, not a current one. As it's currently framed in terms of the proposed um, African Court on Justice, Human and People's Rights, immunities will still apply. This raises questions as to whether for those people currently in power who are perpetrating crimes where the victims will have to wait until they leave office and will it be 26 years for them too? These are things that African states, African policymakers, as well as African civil society need to be thinking about. Should immunities remain and what will that do in terms of the delay in justice? What will that do in terms of the messages coming out from victims and survivors that justice is integral to peace and that they agitate for justice even more strongly when justice is delayed. 
I'm going to end here and hand over to, to the question and answer uh, segment. Um, and in many ways, have just introduced some of the key issues arising from Isena Bray's prosecution um, and emphasizing that it is a monumental, pivotal decision coming out of an African court. And it's something that in many ways can be emulated, but we do have to bear in mind some of the pros as well as the cons. As far as I know, there have been discussions uh, in Senegal about this. Uh, in terms of um, from the African Union and from ECOWAS, um, I, I haven't heard much in terms of discussions around how to capitalize on this. Um, what I can say is that it is very important to, to draw as many lessons from, from this prosecution as possible. Uh, of course, Isena Bray can still appeal um, and and that appeal is um, it's it's likely that he will he will appeal his his conviction as well as his sentence. And I think during this process now, especially uh, for the African Union, which is uh, preparing now for for the next AU summit, I think it's very important for ministers of justice um, as well as for the African Union summit to take stock of these experiences and 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 look to see how how best to how best to model justice. I think it's worth noting that the Minister of Justice of Senegal, Siddiqui Kaba, is also the president of the Assembly of States Parties to the Rome Statute. And so for Senegal, this has been about their contribution, not just to um, domestic justice, regional justice, but also international justice. Um, this is a very important question, and I think it's, it's it's also important to emphasize that there are efforts being made in individual African countries, and so in the short term, but also moving to the to the medium and long term, it is important for African countries to themselves take ownership of international justice. These are crimes that are being committed on our continent. These are crimes that are being committed against African citizens. In protecting African citizens, then um, African countries uh, should have the right legal framework in place. And this includes having laws that criminalize uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, as well as genocide. Um, and what has, what has happened um, in, 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 in a number of countries is they've done exactly that. Examples, for example, uh, more recent examples uh, in Uganda, they have now, or they are starting the, the, the prosecution of Tomas Quello, a former Lord's Resistance Army rebel. At the same time in the DRC, they are prosecuting through the military courts as well as through the civilian courts now, uh, people who, who, are, who they regard as complicit in international crimes. It's important that African countries do this. Because if African countries do not do this, and if all we have is one person, say Isena Bre, who's the former head of state convicted, the people who carried out the crimes, the other people rather who carried out the crimes, uh, if they go unpunished, then we do create a space for impunity. In June of 2014, at the AU summit in Equatorial Guinea, AU heads of state uh, adopted an amendment protocol um, which includes a new international criminal law section that will have jurisdiction over, um, amongst a, a list of other crimes, the international crimes of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. To date, no African country has ratified this um, protocol. However, there has been a number of signatures. Now, uh, in terms of actually bringing this, um, bringing this court into being, uh, there does need to be 15 ratifications. And then, and only after that, um, can process processes be put in place in terms of actually establishing the court. So what we have at the moment is this protocol um, that African countries must sign up to. Uh, some issues have been raised, most notably um, by Amnesty International, for example, that the African court protocol provides for immunity of heads of state. And because it provides for immunity of heads of state as well as senior government officials, 
the, the, the challenge then is what happens uh, where these are the people implicated in the crimes. And so this is a conversation that is still ongoing in terms of how to better frame the African court in a way that is beneficial to, to the citizens that it's meant to be serving, and rather to not have the African court as, um, as, as a deflection from, from international justice. But uh, in terms of other efforts towards institutionalizing um, uh, international criminal justice prosecutions. Um, near the end of last year, uh, through recommendations made by the African Union Commission into South Sudan, there was a recommendation that a hybrid court into South Sudan be established. So the African Union is also looking towards having ad hoc tribunals that deal with these crimes. Of course, the challenges that we have highlighted in terms of financing, in terms of actually establishing these courts remain, but it is worth noting that there are, at least on paper, efforts to, to establish institutions that can deal with these crimes at a domestic as well as at a regional level. The challenge now is an implementation.